In fact, he asked the right question. It was the perfect of the lips of man. How can I get to heaven? What do, does it take for me to gain eternal life? And the man didn't know it yet, but not only was that the perfect question, not only is that the only question that has eternal significance, he was asking the perfect person, too, literally. He was asking the perfect Savior, the perfect Jesus, who not only knew the answer, but he was the answer. How do I get to heaven? How do I get from this place to the place that God has promised? The man was an expert in the law. That means that he grew up and was raised and he lived immersed in the law of God, in the Torah. He was one who was an expert, a scribe, maybe even a teacher. And he lived up to his name as the expert as Jesus asked him a question and he was able to quote two passages from the Old Testament. I'm guessing that you take your car to an expert mechanic. You hope that he's an expert because if you have a question about how your car should be operating or how it is operating, you want him to be able to answer. You want your mechanic to be able to tell you what an alternator is. You want your mechanic to be able to tell you just how long you can go before getting an oil change or changing the spark plugs. If your mechanic doesn't know those things, you need to go to a different mechanic. You need to find someone who's more of an expert. Jesus' question was right up the alley of this expert of the law. What must I do to be saved? Jesus allows him to answer his own question. He answers the question with a question and says to him, what does the law say? How do you read it? The expert in the law quotes two passages from the textbook, from God's holy law. One from Deuteronomy chapter 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And he easily transitions into a quote from another book, from Leviticus chapter 19, and love your neighbor as yourself. Every student loves to get affirmation from his teacher. They love to be commended for an answer that was offered that is well thought out. The grade schooler loves the sticker on the top of the test that says, job well done. And Jesus gives an attaboy to the expert in the law. He gives him the verbal pat on the back as he says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the man isn't filled with glee. He doesn't skip off into his happily ever after. It wasn't good enough just for Jesus to tell him that he was right. That wasn't his goal. That wasn't what he was trying to accomplish that day. The story begins by us finding out that the expert in the law was trying to trick Jesus, was trying to trap him. Perhaps it was because he had heard Jesus preaching about mercy and grace and forgiveness. He had heard Jesus telling Anyone who would hear that he was the way to everlasting life, that he was the one through whom you must go to get to everlasting life in heaven. He didn't see that in his law. He didn't feel like that was the truth. He thought that there might be a different way, and so he got Jesus one-on-one and thought that he could trap him, thought that he could trick him, thought that he could prove him wrong based on the law that he was an expert in, not Jesus. You can imagine his surprise when Jesus says, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do this, and you will live. Well, that wasn't the argument he was hoping to have, and he wasn't looking for common ground. He was hoping to win the argument based on the law, and so he knew that he and Jesus were different. He just had to explore a little more to find out why. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We hear those words from Jesus, and we don't skip off in glee to our happily ever afters 
either. Not because we're trying to trick Jesus, not because we're hoping to win an argument, but we know what those words really mean and what they really mean for our eternity. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. Those words are true that Jesus speaks. The problem is, the big problem is we can't. We can't keep God's law. Half-hearted devotion is the best that we can come up with. Double-minded dedication is what we offer God all too often. We try to serve him. We try to do the right things. We are faithful in worship, but we don't crucify the sinful nature. We still try to be devoted to the sinful pleasures of this world as well. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. We don't skip away in glee because we know that that's just what's printed on the top side of the coin. You flip that same coin over and we know the sobering truth. Do this and you will live is true. And then the opposite is true as well. Don't do this and you will die. The expert in the law hadn't flipped that coin over yet. He hadn't allowed God's law to sink into his heart the way that Jesus wanted it to. He thought that he still could be saved based on his obedience to the law, based on his adherence to God's commands. And so he presses Jesus a little bit more. What is this neighbor? Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's talk about that. And Jesus talks and teaches. Jesus gives a a well-known parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, to teach the man a lesson on love. He tells him that in order to be saved through the law, you have to show selfless Samaritan love. It's no coincidence that Jesus chose a Samaritan to be the hero of the story. Jesus chose the person who the expert in the law, the expert in Jewish law, wouldn't have wanted to associate with. Had the roles been reversed, he would have walked on the other side of the street. Regardless of the state of need of of the Samaritan, the Jew would have walked on the other side of the street. In fact, they'd walk on the other side of the country. They'd cross rivers to avoid interacting with Samaritans. Literally, they would do that. Those that lived in the south in, in Judea, if they wanted to get up north to Galilee, they wouldn't go from point A to point B. They wouldn't take the most direct route because that would take them through dreaded Samaria and they might have to interact with a Samaritan. And so instead they'd cross the river and they would venture north outside of the country and then come back in all in an effort to avoid a Samaritan. It's no coincidence that Jesus chose a Samaritan as the model love bearer in the story. And the two men that the expert in the law would have associated most closely with, they were the ones who were the negative example. They were the ones who were loveless and selfish. Jesus wanted the expert in the law to understand. He wants us to understand that the law to love demands that we love more than just those people who are near to us. A neighbor is not just the person who lives in the house next door. A neighbor's not just the person who looks like us, acts like us, talks like us, eats like us. A neighbor is another blood-bought soul, another one for whom Jesus died. A neighbor is anyone that we encounter in this world. God's law of love tells us to show love, selfless Samaritan love, not just when it's convenient or prudent or safe, but at all times and in all places. That's what selfless Samaritan love looks like. That's what the law demands. The law of our God is a difficult law to keep. A difficult law to keep because we can never shed that sinful nature that lives inside of us. That sinful nature that's always gratifying its own cravings and desires, that's always seeking what's comfortable and safe and convenient and easy things that it presents as pleasing to the flesh. But showing selfless Samaritan love is quite the opposite. It's going out of your way to help a person in need. 
It's taking a risk. It's showing love when there's a promise that there won't be any return. When you know for a fact you won't get anything out of it, that's selfless Samaritan love. We can't and we don't love that way. We're selfish even in the love that we choose. We're liberal in the excuses that we make for why it is we shouldn't love that person or this or, or, or that. The subtle or maybe not so subtle racism that tells us it's okay to love those who are like me, but I better be skeptical of those who aren't. That's the vile nature of the sinful heart. That's us. That's how unwilling we are to love. To love with a selfless Samaritan love. And because of that, we deserve a fate far worse than the man who fell into the hands of robbers. We deserve worse than to be beaten and bloodied on the side of the road. We deserve worse than to have a priest and a Levite walk past. We deserve to be passed by by our God. In short, we deserve hell. But we have a Savior God who couldn't stand to see us endure that fate He wouldn't walk past us. He couldn't think of it. Instead, he stoops down to help, leaving heaven and coming to earth to be your Savior and mine. He does more than just bandage our wounds. He lays and bleeds for you and for me. He lived a perfect life of love so that we could be forgiven for the times that we are loveless and selfish. He did it all so that we could be forgiven. Jesus did more than just take a risk in loving us. He knew for a fact that a vile and horrific death would come, and yet he loved you and he loved me. Jesus did more than allow himself to lay half dead on the side of the road. He went all the way, giving 100% of his life as he bled and died on the cross for you. Jesus showed selfless Samaritan love taking no interest in the impact it will have on himself, but rather thinking only, cherishing only the glorious result that his love has for you, for your life today and for your eternity. Jesus loved you so much more than himself, more than life, and so he offered you selfless Samaritan love. He wanted nothing more than for you to be in heaven, and he let nothing hinder that goal. He wanted you to know the answer that the answer that he longed for and hoped for and prayed that the expert in the law would come to. That we can't keep the law well enough. That we can't obey our way into heaven, but we need Jesus and his grace and his mercy. How do you think the man in the story would have replied when the Samaritan came back? Presumably, When the Samaritan came back from his journey, the the man who was beaten and bloodied was still there. Days before he couldn't walk, he most likely was still there in the inn. Jesus doesn't extend the story that far, and so we can't be sure, but imagine that he is. What, What do you think his response would be? How do you think he would react? He's received life saving care from a stranger. A stranger who put his neck on the line, who put his life on the line to show this love. He got an escort to an inn. He got a private room. He had all expenses paid. And he was left with a trustworthy person. And as if that weren't enough love to be shown, days later he comes back. He does a follow-up visit to make sure that there aren't any more bills to pay, to make sure that there's no more medical attention To be rendered, he he comes back and continues to go out of his way to show this love. How do you think the Samaritan was received? How do you think the man who fell into the hands of robbers responded? Days later, as his strength is coming back, as his health is being restored, to see that man again, to to look eye to eye with the one to whom he now owed his life, how, how do you think he responded? I don't see a version of this story that ends in anything except overflowing thanksgiving and praise. 
I, I can't imagine there would be any response except this gratitude, this appreciation, this desire to do anything, anything to repay the generosity, the selfless Samaritan love that was shown to him. His strength is returning, and I, I, I would imagine he'd use every ounce of that strength to show how much he appreciated, to show what it meant to him that someone would show selfless love to him. My friends, Christ Jesus has shown you selfless Samaritan love. It cost him his life, but he was willing to pay it. It inconvenienced him greater than we'll ever know, yet he was willing to do it. And it wasn't just enough for him to offer that life-saving care 2,000 years ago. He continues to follow up with you, to offer his nurture, to feed you with word and sacrament, to bandage the wounds that your sins have caused through words of absolution spoken by a pastor or a friend. He continues to feed you with word and sacrament. He continues to guard and guide and protect you with his mighty power and his gracious love. How are you going to respond? I can't imagine an ending to this story that's anything except overflowing thanksgiving and praise. I can't imagine that we collectively would want to muster every ounce of strength that we have to sing the praises of our holy God who loved us so much that he came to earth to die, who loved us so much that he gave up heaven so that it could be ours. I can't imagine our desires being anywhere except thanksgiving. I can't imagine our hearts being anywhere except solely focused on him. I can't imagine our lives lived in any other way except for the one who lived and died for us. Jesus told the expert in the law, go and do likewise. He answered the question correctly. The one who showed mercy was the neighbor. Jesus said, go and be a neighbor. Go and be neighborly in the life that you live. Go and be neighborly with the people that you interact with, whether they're like you or not like you. Show them the love that you can. Reflect for them the love that's been shown to you. Go and do likewise. And my friends, that's Christ's encouragement to us. Go and do likewise. Go and be a neighbor in this world. Go and find the outcast and befriend them. Go and find the hurting, the sorrowful, the depressed and help them to share in joy with you and Jesus. Be neighborly. Show selfless Samaritan love. It's what God showed to you in Christ and it's what we are privileged to show to one another. My friends, go and do likewise. Go with joy in your heart and eagerness in your soul. Go into the world and show selfless Samaritan love. Amen.